Hundreds dead, thousands infected across multiple continents. Millions quarantined with whole cities in lockdown. But how did the coronavirus spread so quickly? We're gonna trace the virus day by day over the first month of the outbreak, following its path from patient zero in China to across the world, and what might happen next. As people everywhere celebrate the start of a new decade, the World Health Organization is told that a handful of people in the city of Wuhan in China had pneumonia, with no other clear causes or origin. But there's one common theme that connects the patients, Hunan Seafood Wholesale Market. Many of these first cases are linked to workers at the market selling live fish, birds, and other animals. As a precaution, the market is shut on January the 1st. Nearly a week later, on January the 7th, Chinese authorities say they've identified the cause of the pneumonia, a new virus in the wider coronavirus group, which includes the common cold and SARS. Now this sparks serious concerns. 17 years ago, the SARS epidemic began in China and went on to kill 800 people. The new virus is temporarily named 2019 NCOV, but becomes popularly known as the coronavirus. Two days later, on January the 9th, the first death is confirmed, a 61-year-old man. He was a regular visitor to the market in Wuhan. By now, 41 people are known to be infected with the virus. At this stage, Wuhan's health commission says there's no evidence the virus could spread between humans. Yet by week two, the new novel coronavirus isn't just affecting China. On January the 13th, Thailand reports its first case. Now, to understand how and why the infection spread, it's key to look at the timing of it. Reports of the first death in China came just before Chinese New Year, the country's biggest holiday and a time when millions are traveling all across the country and abroad. As planes left Wuhan airport, so too did the virus. On the 15th of January, Japan reports its first case. Then on the 20th of January, South Korea does too. On the same day that South Korea reports its first case, it's confirmed the coronavirus can pass from person to person. And official figures become clearer as the World Health Organization starts to publish daily reports. This is when the numbers erupt, with 282 cases reported from four countries. The next day, 314 cases are confirmed, including 16 healthcare workers. It then jumps to 581, with the majority still in China on January the 23rd. With the numbers rising, the city of Wuhan is put under quarantine. This is usually a very busy street. Another beautiful day in quarantine, Wuhan. Anyone in public is told to wear a face mask, and the Chinese government sends 300,000 extra masks to help. Then, at 2 a.m., it's announced that all public transport is to be shut down, and anyone wanting to leave the city has eight hours before all exits are closed. From 10 a.m., Wuhan, a city with a population bigger than London, is in lockdown. A brand new 1,000 bed hospital begins to be built to treat the virus, with the aim of completing the whole thing in just a matter of days. China has history here. In the midst of the SARS epidemic in 2003, as Beijing battled severe acute respiratory syndrome, a new facility for patients was constructed in just one week. Almost a month after first learning about the virus, on the 30th of January, the WHO now declares a public health emergency, with the main reason being its global spread. Away from China, there are now 82 cases in 18 countries, but no deaths outside of China yet. And in Germany, Japan, Vietnam, France, and the United States, people who have been to China are now infecting those who haven't. Come the last day in January, the virus spreads to England, where two members of the same family test positive. In China, meanwhile, there are now 2,000 new cases in just the last 24 hours, and the virus has now reached every state in the country, bringing the worldwide total to 9,800 cases across 21 countries. The biggest quarantine in history right now taking place in China. I think you're going to see that more amplified now as a result of, of this declaration. The United States declares a public health emergency and says that it will begin temporarily suspending entry for foreign nationals who have traveled to China in the last 14 days. That's against the advice of the WHO. Yet there have still been no deaths outside China. Come the start of the month, three more countries report having the virus, bringing the total to 24. Following on from the United States lead, 
Australia says it will also refuse entry to all non-citizens arriving from China. Australian nationals coming from China will be quarantined for two weeks, something the UK, South Korea, Singapore and New Zealand are beginning to also do as they evacuate citizens from China and monitor them for symptoms. We have arrived at quarantine. On Sunday the 2nd of February, the first death is reported outside of mainland China. A 44-year-old Chinese man from Wuhan dies of the virus in the Philippines. And then by February the 4th, a second death outside the Chinese mainland was confirmed in Hong Kong. So looking back from the start of the year to February the 11th, the novel coronavirus has infected more than 43,000 people globally, the majority of those in China. And the Chinese authorities now say it's caused the death of more than 1,000 people in the country, although the number of new infections day by day has begun to decline. That means more people have died from the novel coronavirus than they did during the SARS outbreak in China. But is it as deadly? And what does the first month of this outbreak tell us about the nature of the coronavirus? Currently, experts believe the virus has killed around 3% of those it has infected. That's a lower death rate than SARS, which had a mortality rate of just under 10%, and other diseases like Ebola, which kills around 50% of those it infects. However, coronavirus has infected more than five times as many people as SARS ever did. So crucially, what might happen next? A lot depends on how well the virus is contained. What we can use right now are what are called non-pharmaceutical interventions, preventing mass gatherings, potentially closing schools, potentially even introducing travel restrictions. It's going to be a real challenge to contain it. The Chinese have been applauded by the WHO for their response to the virus, with the Director General saying they have set a new standard for their reaction to the outbreak. The speed with which China detected the outbreak, isolated the virus, sequenced the genome and shared it with WHO and the world are very impressive. Now, the Chinese have admitted to their own shortcomings in their initial dealings with the virus. In the first few days and weeks, officials have been accused of downplaying the severity of the virus. A doctor in Wuhan tried to warn colleagues late in December, and he was accused by authorities of spreading false information, although they later apologised. Then, in early February, the doctor himself was killed by the very virus he tried to warn against, sparking outrage at the Chinese government. Many experts now believe that by not alerting the public and healthcare professionals much earlier, a crucial opportunity was lost to stop the disease from becoming an epidemic. The coronavirus has been contained to an extent by widespread health interventions. That means quarantining those infected to stop the spread. That relies on huge international cooperation and identifying who's infected, where they've been, and who could have also got it. Countries are already making huge steps to control it, like monitoring airports, banning travel, and isolating patients. But these methods rely on the virus only spreading when people show symptoms, something which scientists are unsure about. Another way it could end is simply by a vaccine or a cure. Researchers in multiple countries are trying to find a vaccine, but at the moment there isn't one, and it could be months or even a year before there's a breakthrough. What we do know is that the major risk comes from the virus spreading to countries who do not have as advanced healthcare systems. These countries would be less able to cope with an outbreak and less effective at quarantining and controlling the spread. Our greatest concern is the potential for the virus to spread to countries with weaker health systems and which are ill prepared to deal with it. The key message from the WHO is to prepare all countries for the possibility of an outbreak and to ensure they are ready to contain it. The WHO also says that the world is still not ready for a global pandemic, that often we operate on a quote, cycle of panic and neglect. So basically, we throw money at problems when they break out, but do nothing to ensure we're prepared to prevent the next one. The world remains dangerously unprepared for a global pandemic. For too long, the world has operated on a cycle of panic and neglect. We throw money at an outbreak, and when it's over, we forget about it and do nothing to prevent the next one. This is dangerously short-sighted and frankly difficult to understand. If we fail to prepare, we are preparing to fail. 
As China and other countries continue to try to contain the virus, what's the best advice for you regarding the outbreak? The Department of Health in the UK has called the coronavirus a serious and imminent threat to public health, but the overall risk in the UK remains moderate. For those of you who visited China, Thailand, Japan, the Republic of Korea, Hong Kong, Taiwan, Singapore, Malaysia or Macau in the last 14 days and have a cough, fever or difficulty breathing, Public Health England says you must contact your GP by phone. A number of experts have said there's no need for the general public to wear masks in places where the risk of infection is low. The current WHO infection control advice for the general public does not mention masks or goggles, focusing instead on hand washing, covering the mouth while sneezing and avoiding raw and undercooked food. To uh, stop transmission of this virus, it's very important that sick people wear masks. That's for clear. For people who have no symptoms, uh, the mask uh, will not necessarily uh, protect them 100% because if they don't apply uh, other measures, it's not sufficient. So my message is more that mask alone is not enough. It's a package of measures that you have to put in place. And if people uh, use the entire package, it's fine. If they just use mask, uh, I think it's not enough. So that's how the novel coronavirus went from an unknown infection in a market in Wuhan to a global health scare that has dominated news headlines for most of 2020. What comes next depends on how countries around the world cooperate to ensure the virus is contained.